Welcome everybody. It is great to be with you today. I'm Pastor Jack, the wife Joyce, and we're honored and blessed to be able to minister the truth to you. Today I've got a message. It's called, Tell Me the Truth. And it really comes from John's Gospel, chapter 8, where Jesus said, if you continue in the truth, you would know the truth and the truth would set you free. We're going to talk about today how this word, if we get it into our hearts, how it can set you free in every area in your life. You know, coming to church is more than just a community thing. It is a training thing where we train ourselves so that God's power can operate through us. Yeah, because it's only by God's power and by His Word that's going to get us into the victory that He's called us to. You know, there's so many times maybe we don't want to hear what God has to say, but but that's the direction that, that we need to follow, you know, with, with all of our passion, with all of our heart, is, is to find out what God's Word is saying for our lives for today and follow the, that Word. Amen. So get ready right now and get your Bibles open and we'll go right into our service and let the Lord bless you. Today I've entitled this message, Tell Me the Truth. And it really comes from this idea of the power of truth. I learned from the very early on when I was a Christian, I had a quest for truth. Before I knew Jesus, I was seeking all kinds of truth but it wasn't the truth. And when I got saved, I started seeking it because I read in my Bible that said, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. And so I've always made that a pursuit in my life to pursue truth. And I'm here to tell you today that when you per, 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 pursue, pursue truth of God's word in your life and you're extreme when it comes to believing what God says, there is no miracles that you won't be able to get. There'll be no breakthroughs that you will not be able to experience in your life. It's because we don't pursue truth through our faith that many things are withheld from us in this life. Now, thank God for God's mercy and most of us make it to heaven. But I want the kingdom of God to be manifested in this life as well as in the life to come. Amen? Amen. And so this series I've been teaching on being extreme in your faith, it isn't meant so that we would be radical or we would be reckless. It just means that in order for this word to work in your life, you have to be completely consumed with the truth that you believe in. Because the flesh is so intoxicating, it's so powerful, it will distract you from the truth. And so you have to... Uh, be extreme about it. And you see it in the Bible. You see uh, four men with a friend on a pallet. They were extreme in their faith. They climbed up on the roof, tore up the roof, and let the man down before Jesus. And Jesus healed him. Or Peter stepping out on the water. Who in the world would step out on the water, uh, you know, in a storm unless it was extreme faith? And you find this all through the Word where the people that received were people that were so extreme in, in the truth that Jesus said, they wouldn't let anything else distract them and they believed for it and, and, and God would give them the miracle because of it. And so as we look at this today, I want you to evaluate yourself and say, Do I, have I, am, I, am I really pressing into this truth the way that I should? Am I really believing in hook, like, and sinker or is it just added to a bunch of beliefs I have? Because miracles come when you're fully persuaded by the truth. So look with me in Revelation chapter 3, and we've been looking at the church of Laodicea. And most scholars agree that the church of Laodicea is a type of the end time church right before Jesus comes back. And I say that because there's a lot of correlations. First of all, in Revelation chapter 1, he speaks of the things that are and the things that will be. So he's definitely talking about the future. And so most people take the church of Laodicea as a church that is symbolic of the church that we have in today in the world generally for the church. But listen to what he says about it. This is the truth. I know your works that you are neither cold or hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, remember the word cold and hot are extreme terms in the Greek cold means freezing frigid hot means boiling steamy 
So he says, I could accept any type of extreme work that you've done by faith, but I won't accept this lukewarmness. Now, I think it's significant because he uses something that was happening in the community that everyone hated. They hated the lukewarm water because you have two mountain fronts on, on both sides of, and they were in the valley. Now, one mountain front, uh, cold water would come down, glacial water, and by the time it got down to the, vo- the water, it was lukewarm. And then you had, on the other side, you had this other mountain rain, and the water would come down, and it was hot, it was hot springs, and it would come down, and I saw this in Israel, it would come down, and, it, and, and they hit together, and they'd become lukewarm. So if you lived in the city there, you hated the water, just like we hate the rain. So God took something that they disliked anyway and applied a spiritual position to them in their own life. And he said, listen, this is so disgusting to me. I want to vomit you out of my mouth. But how many know God is loving? Amen. But he's trying to make a point. And I, and I, I looked at that and I said to myself, what is it about What is it that created the lukewarm church in the first place? There must be something that they were dabbling, something they were involved with that caused them to stop operating in the way that was pleasing to God. What was it exactly? And if you look down in verse 18, he says this, I advise you to to buy gold from me refined in fire. And that's a real key to it. You know why? Why? Because in Scripture, that is reference to faith. Isaiah 55, 1 says this, If you're thirsty and hunger, come to me and buy bread and water without price, without wages. It's free. He's talking about faith. See, faith doesn't come because you go to church. Faith because you heard. Faith is free. When you hear the word of God, faith comes. And he's telling the church, I want you to get in my word and hear my word until you get enough faith that fire begins to burn inside of you and you can do things for me out of faith rather than out of dead works. I don't want a church that is convenient that only serves to their physical ability. I want a church that is instilled by my power because you you believe in faith that I will help you, that I will equip you. I want a church that's like Paul that said, I labored more than abundantly than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that operated within him. He wants a church that does the impossible. And the only way you can do the impossible is if God is working through you. But this church was working for God out of their own strength you see it in today's church convenient Christianity you go to church when it's convenient you serve if it's convenient you give and whatever you can afford and it's all built on the assumption that you only have to do what you can do naturally God didn't call us to do natural things he called us to do supernatural things When you lead someone to Christ, you can't do it through intellectual assent. You can only do it if the Spirit of God opens the person's heart. When you pray for the sick, I'm not talking about taking supplements. I'm talking about God's divine assistance in what you do in your life. And so I say this with all my heart, that to be a church that is on fire for the Lord, you have to be a church that is feeding on faith. If you don't feed on faith, you're going to run into trouble. And I want want to say this. The Bible speaks that in the last days, there'll be a great falling away. It says that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. What is the great falling away? Well, Paul spoke of it in Galatians. He says falling from grace. These were people that started out and they knew they couldn't do anything to be saved so they trusted in Christ and they were saved. But then afterwards they said, well, I gotta do this to keep saved. And as soon as they did that, they fell from grace and no longer were depending on God's power. And you see it in the church today where people only serve to the measure that they can do out of their own strength. God wants you to serve with his power in your life to help you. 
God wants you to say, Lord, I can't do this on my own, but if you help me, I can do it. Lord, Lord, I can't do this in the natural. I don't want to, but Lord, if you move on my spirit and help me, I'll be able to. He wants a church like that. And so the great falling away is really a church that is no longer operating in faith. They're operating by human ability. And I believe today that God wants us to go beyond that. There's so much he wants us to do. He wants us to build buildings. He wants us to build churches. He wants us to reach the world. He wants us to do so much that takes the supernatural power of God to do it. And you likewise need to be like that. And if you are, then you're going, the flesh will no longer have control over you. Which tells me one of two things. It tells me that the flesh does not have control over me when those negative emotions have been eradicated by faith in Christ. I'll be able to overcome my flesh, but I won't be able to do it if I don't. Now, as I preach this, let me just say this. What this means is this. When you come to Jesus, you are forgiven of all your sins. When I mean all your sins, I mean your past sins, your present sins, and your future sins. All sins when you come to Christ. Now, most people do not believe this. At least some don't. They believe that when you you get saved, God forgives you of all your sins up to the next sin that you commit. And then at that sin, you've got to confess the sin and you've got to do a a form of repentance. Uh, And if you do, then God will forgive you. Here's the problem with that view. It's First of all, it's wrong. But the second problem is when you believe that way, it creates a form of of unrighteousness that's not 100%, which will affect the way that you approach God. Let me give you an example. Most people, when they get saved, they've got some big issues in their life. And the grace of God usually helps them get delivered from it. But then comes the issues that don't go away so easy. Worry. Come on. Forgetfulness. Whatever these weaknesses that are kind of built into your, your clan or whatever that your father had that you had and all that, and it caused a problem. And at first you start, and say, Lord, I'm sorry, Lord, and I won't do that again, and you repent of it. But after the thousandth time of repenting, you get this thought, God hasn't forgiven me because if I'd really repented, I'd never do it again. And so you live out the rest of your Christian life like this. 80% of your sins are forgiven, but there's 30% that are not. So every time you go to God for help, you can't really get your head in the door because you know you only got 80%. There's 30% that could get you fried. And so you're unable to boldly come to the throne of grace because of that 30%. And the problem is, the 30%, you're trying to be forgiven by what you do. And you're never forgiven by what you do. You're forgiven by what you believe in. Now, understand this. When God gave you the gift of righteousness, it wasn't a righteousness that was created from anything that you did. It was created from Christ. And that gift is the same level or a measure that God measures Jesus at. And when you get that, you can go boldly to the throne of God. Every time you come in there, you're not a little less. You're not a little bit... No, you are exactly at the same level that Jesus is. That's why the Scripture says, as he is, so are we in this world. Now, that won't happen if you don't believe that you are freed from all your sins when you accept Christ. That doesn't mean that you don't deal with them that come up, and and there's nothing wrong with confessing your faults to God, but God doesn't forgive you because you confess your sins. He forgives you because you believed in Christ. I think we need to be honest with God. We're having this problem. Admit it. But if you've accepted Christ, the blood has satisfied the demands of God. Can I go a little deeper here? Can I go a little deeper? Let me read you this verse. I I didn't give it to the people upstairs, but let me read you this verse, and I'm going to explain a a word that most people don't know what it means. 
In, in, in 1 John 2, 2, it says this, and he himself is our propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Notice it says that Christ is the propitiation of our sins. The question is, what in the world is a propitiation? What does that mean? Well, it comes from the Old Testament. And if you remember in the Old Testament, Moses built the Ark of the Covenant, and in it you had a tent, and then there was in the Holies of Holies an ark. Remember Indiana Jones? Yep. Raiders of the Lost Ark? An ark just like that. And now inside the ark was the broken commandments that Moses uh, broke when Israel rebelled against the word. And then also is in there is Aaron's rod that budded. That's when, when the people rebelled against the priesthood that God had chosen. And then a, a jar of manna where the, where the angel food came down from heaven that they murmured about is in there. It's all inside the ark, and on the lid of the ark is a seat. It's called the mercy seat. And the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat, and when the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat, then what God, when he looked at the people, all he saw was the blood he didn't see the broken commandments. He didn't see the rebellion. He didn't see the murmuring. He didn't see the complaining. All he saw was the blood. When you accept Christ, all God sees is Jesus. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Said hallelujah! You mean he doesn't see all my mistakes? What? No, no. He sees you in Christ. He sees you sanctified by the blood. It doesn't mean that you're perfect, but it means that way you can go boldly to the throne of grace and you can receive mercy to help you so you don't sin. But you've got to have that confidence to receive mercy by his blood or you're going to try to earn the right to that mercy I learned this years ago I was going to college, Green River College and I had did a Hollywood stop you know what a Hollywood stop is it's where you don't stop completely at a stop sign <laughs> kind of roll up roll off and I did that, there's a police officer there so he pulls me over and gives me a ticket I said man I'm a student here I don't have this money he said well just go to court They'll probably reduce the fine. So I went to the court, and I went in there, and uh, I just want to get the price reduced. And there was a lady there, you know, that, standing outside that, that gave directions on what courtroom to go to or whatever. I said, I'm here because I want to get my ticket reduced. And she said, uh, are you guilty or innocent? I said, what's that got to do with anything? I said, I just want to get the ticket reduced. She said, let me, let me give you some information. She said, you can't receive mercy until you admit you're guilty. If you're not guilty, you can't get any mercy. You only get mercy when you're guilty. I said, I'm guilty, I'm guilty, I'm guilty, I'm guilty, I'm guilty. We're all guilty, come on. We're all guilty, but we can get mercy from God. We can get mercy from Jesus. That's the truth. Yes. Tell me the truth, Amen. and it'll change my life. And I'm saying this so that I want to help some of you so you don't continually backslide, continually do stupid things, and you do that because you don't believe right. If you believed right, you would live right. Give me an example of this. In scripture, I'm learning just now what I taught you, how God loves me. He doesn't wait for me to be perfect. God's up in heaven. He looked at his creation and say, my justice says I have to deal with the sin in their life. So if they come close to me, my sin will kill them. So what am I going to do? I don't want to kill them. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go down there, put on flesh, die in their stay so that my justice can be satisfied and then I'll be able to love them unconditionally for the eternity. Amen. Wow. Well, I'm supposed to love my wife that same way. Now, I know everybody thinks Joyce got little wings on her back. 
but I've seen them when they're broken. <laughs> and so when I love her, I gotta love, I'm loving it. See, because I'm loved that way by God, I can love her that way. Amen. But what if I thought the love that God gave me was love that came because I always do anything right? Then I would never love her that way. I'd go, I'll, I'll take, I'll, you know, I'll be nice to you if you do the right thing. Because that's the way I do with God. God loves me because I always do the right thing. And you would never have a good marriage. But because I know how much God loves me in my imperfections, waiting for me to change, I can love her in her imperfections, waiting for her to change. And even if she doesn't change, I'm still going to love her for eternity. In fact, I'm going to shack up with her in heaven. Amen to that. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So, so in heaven, God doesn't have uh, your sins in the cloud. When they were forgiven, the Bible said that God blotted them out. It's a term that we don't really understand, but in the culture that Paul was in, they didn't have ink like we have with acid in it. They just had colors. And they would put it on parchment paper. And so if they wanted to reuse the parchment paper, they would take a sponge and they'd just wipe it clean from the colors that they used for the parchment paper because there was no ink. And so when he says blotted out your sins, he means that's what God did. He blotted out all your wrongs. The Bible makes it even clear that God will remember your sins no more. Wow. That should give you that boldness that you really want in your life. The boldness to follow after God. The boldness to seek him with all your heart. The boldness to say, Lord, I need some help here. And I know you're not going to fry me because I approach you. Father, I thank you so much for this mercy and grace in my life. Thank you for blessing me. Thank you for bringing it over the top. Thank you, Lord, for loving me unconditionally. Thank you, Lord, for not leaving me or forsaking me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There was a, a story in the Bible in Luke 7 where a woman came and washed Jesus' feet with her tears with a bunch of religious leaders and she was crying over his feet and wiping them with her tears and, and just blessing him. And uh, one of the religious leaders got upset with him and said, you know, if you were a prophet, you would know what kind of woman she is. And Jesus gives him a parable, two parables. One or one parable that talked about two people that, that owed money. One owed a lot of money, the other owed a little bit of money. He said the one that had loaned him the money canceled both debts. And he said, which one loves more? And Simon says, well, the one that owed the biggest debt. He says, you've spoken correctly. And then he mentions this about the woman. When I came in here, you didn't wash my feet. You didn't bless me like that. You didn't kiss me. She's done all that, and he says, because she's been forgiven much, you love much. Do you notice how he said that? Because she's been forgiven much, she loves much. And I mean, I've always thought that, all right, Lord, I was a really huge sinner, so that's probably why I love you so much. But there's a verse, the next part of the verse I never understood. Then he tells the woman, he says, woman, your sins are forgiven. And he just told her, the religious leader and everybody that, you know, this woman loves a lot because she's already been forgiven a lot. And then he tells the woman, your sins are forgiven. Well, why would he say something he already said? Because the word forgiveness is in the perfect tense. It means a past action with present results that doesn't need to be repeated. In other words, what he's telling the woman is this. I will never, God will never hold against you the sins that you have been forgiven for. If you screw up next week, those sins will never be brought up in remembrance. If you, if you screw up a year from now, those sins will never be brought up again. If you screw up three years from now, those sins will never be brought up again. And some of you need to hear that right now, praise God, because the world will bring it up. 
They'll say, you don't deserve that. You shouldn't get that. Why are you in that position? Why do you get to do that? And they'll say, that's not right. You shouldn't be able to do that. God washed it under the blood. God blotted it out, praise God. You are qualified. You are blessed. Join us at the River on Wednesdays and Sundays for weekly services, as well as great programs for kids, youth, and young adults. Visit riveroflifefellowship.org to view our calendar of events. There's something for everyone at the River, where family matters.